Good morning and welcome to the first of our four end of the growing season webinars. Over the next few weeks, you will have the opportunity to hear from our experts at NDSU about the major issues and possible solutions for crops to be harvested, stored and marketed. Thanks to all our speakers for making the commitment to participate. Please note that starting next week, the webinars will be on Tuesdays starting at 10 a.m. For those of you who have other activities planned at the same time, we will be recording and you'll have access to the webinars. Today, we have Drs. Uh, Brian Parman and Frayne Olson as our presenters. Feel free to place questions in the chat box. The presenters will answer questions at the end of their presentations. There will also be time at the end of the presentations for general discussions. Thank you for joining us today. Sam and I hope that you find these webinars helpful in serving our clientele. I now hand you over to our presenters. Thanks, uh, Mohammed. I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and go first. Uh, we decided so Fran and I will kind of talk for 30, 35 minutes ish and uh, leave time at the end for general questions as well. So what I'm going to talk about today is just some general fall harvest costs. Um, upcoming uh, the, uh, some big product, big ticket production cost items as we head into uh, harvest and then start heading into the, the winter season, sort of an outlook on some, uh, a few of the pr uh, big ticket um, production cost items moving forward. So the first one uh, I wanna talk about as we head into, head into fall is, uh, you know, the, the price of propane, which the big, dry uh, motivation for that is then the potential cost of uh, drying um, grain this fall at harvest and you know last year uh, it wasn't as big of a, a big a deal and this is a chart from uh, Mont Bellevue which is you know down in Te Texas a major uh, propane supplier and uh, uh, refinery and last year so so propane prices uh, right around April, March of this year, when the when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, spiked up. Uh, obviously, not a record as you look at this chart. Um, the highest price really was that period in 08 and 09 uh, when propane was approaching two dollars a gallon, and and you know since then, in in 2014 it was approaching a dollar fifty a gallon, um, and then this spring, if you look at this peak on the right. Uh, that 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 was the early this spring, and that was again approaching, getting close to a dollar fifty a gallon. But last fall, it was also a dollar fifty a gallon. But one of the things going on last fall was we were coming out of a a drought, right? And so the bushels weren't weren't really there in in North Dakota that that needed to be dried. The number of bushels that you would typically expect because we had a we had a drought last year. Uh, crops matured early because of the drought. And as a result, the, the, the need for grain drying just wasn't as strong as, as it is typically in, in, in our state. But this year, uh, there is the potential for that to happen. Now, I'm not a, a meteorologist, so I, I don't have a forecast for how wet or how cool this fall is going to be as, we, as crops get to drying. But what I can say is that we're definitely off the peak uh, for this year anyway where it was approaching $1.50 and it's getting down closer to a dollar a gallon. So it's it's considerably uh, going to be less expensive this year if grain needs to be dried than it would have been uh, the year before if the bushels had been there and, and things got late. And so I use a three month moving average and typically with propane, um, you do see peaks and, and it is a seasonal uh, uh, fuel that typically has higher prices in the winter, lower prices in the summer when it's when demand is a bit lower. So I use this moving average to smooth some of the peaks out and there's been a downward trend again since uh, since the early part of the year. A lot of that was uncertainty uh, as well. You know, you had the invasion. Um, we didn't know we're, we're still trying to figure out and it is impacting places like Europe, uh, especially not not having the access to to propane potentially that they would have had before but again we've seen some relief there so that's some some good news on the, on the propane front or and then and then therefore the grain drying front so if we look at, i took uh these calculations from um our uh 
uh, ag engineering department, specifically Ken Hellevang, he puts together these uh, presentations on the cost of drying grain. Um, he, he does presentations on it every year. So I just created a table here real quick to show, um, for instance, in this, this example is corn, what it would cost if the propane is three dollars a gallon 250 to 150 all the way down to 50 cents the cost per point of moisture reduced and this is at average or typical um you know uh temperatures for the year and then the dollars to remove 10 points of of moisture so if you were going from say 26 percent to 16 or or 25 to 15 percent for instance which is not uncommon for north dakota so if we were down around let's say a dollar fifty per gallon. Uh, so you're looking at about three cents per point of moisture or 30 cents a bushel to remove uh, 10 percent, uh, 10 points of moisture. OK, so that's basically how to read this. So this can be found uh, if anyone needs it. I can send this slide so that folks can kind of get an get an a, a estimate of depending on what they're paying for per gallon of propane, how many points they're going to reduce uh, corn uh, per uh, you know, when at, at harvest using high temperature drying system. And then the cost, for instance, so you can do your own calculation if you're gonna remove 10% versus 8% versus 6%, et cetera, all the way down. So this is just a nice reference table in 50 cent increments, but the calculation can be done for really any price. So if we look at the last three years, what it would have cost for to purchase propane, like I said, 2021, October, uh, last last fall was really the highest uh, as we entered harvest season um, of the last three. Uh, what, well, I think what what I think will be the last four years, including 2022. As of August, uh, the monthly pr uh, price down there at the, the head in Texas, and I realize that this is the, the Texas price and I can look at North Dakota prices as well. But the thing about North Dakota prices is it, they're sometimes a little bit higher than the than the wellhead price and sometimes a little bit lower, but for the most part they're about the same and it's so thinly traded in North Dakota from say April May all the way through September that it's it's hard for me to get a price so I have to take it out of a <clears throat> sort of a national price index for in, in this case, but it's very close I mean we're talking about a couple of cents usually uh, difference so August this year. It's about a dollar thirteen. Uh, it had it does typically spike. Like if you look at this, for 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 instance, twenty nineteen August was forty cents a gallon. By October, it was forty six cents. In November, fifty three. Twenty twenty, fifty cents a gallon. By October, or it was it was about fifty two, fifty three cents a gallon. Okay, um, and then twenty twenty one, it spiked up pretty high in October. A uh, dollar eleven a gallon, all the way up to uh, almost uh, about a dollar forty-five. Right now, it doesn't seem like it's going to see the the big increase, and that's not typically typical that it moves thirty cents or so. Possible that that it, that it's going to happen, but right now it's kind of around that typical dollar dollar ten a gallon that we've seen uh, coming out of August. So there probably will be some increase, uh, but you know, stay tuned to to see where that's going to go. So. Again, I don't expect that drying costs will be as high as they were in 2021 uh, uh, as far as the price that you have to pay per gallon. But overall, drying costs will probably be a lot higher because the bushels will probably be there depending on the weather again uh, for uh, uh, us to have to do some drying. Now, the other consideration to make sure that we always uh, are cognizant of when we're drying grain is that you wind up with some moisture shrink. Um, this is pointed out in the in the presentations given by our ag engineering system. For instance, drying corn from 25 to 15 percent moisture will result in a reduction of about 11.8 percent. Okay, because you're taking the water out. If you're taking something out, whether it's water or solids or something like that, you're going to lose. There's going to be some amount of shrink, for instance. Okay, so that's important for our producers to remember when they're harvesting their grain. If they're it, and most of them already know this. I mean, they're well aware of it, but it does might pay to remind somebody if they're doing a lot of drying, the bushels that they see on the combine, um, you may see a reduction uh, uh, in uh, uh, 
the, the overall amount that you have left after moisture is um, taken out. But of course, test weight does go up um, when that when you when you remove that moisture. So the next topic real quick or harvest topic I wanted to cover was uh, diesel fuel. Um, this particular item. OK, so as we're running trucks up and down the road and we're running uh, grain carts and we're running combines, we're going to be paying a lot per gallon for diesel fuel this year. Uh, definitely uh, considerably more than we paid in 2021. I realize we didn't harvest as much, but it was much lower. And then especially and then in, in 2020. So we're probably right now. I just I pulled these prices not too long ago. Off road diesel was around four dollars, four dollars and 20 cents a gallon in North Dakota. You know, that's that's a buck, buck and a quarter more even uh, than they were last year. So diesel prices are definitely higher this year. That's going to eat into uh, cost quite a bit, especially if we're using doing a lot of trucking up and down the road, running a lot of equipment. We have a lot of bushels to harvest. That's great. Uh, but what we can expect that diesel costs this year are, are going to be significantly higher. Then, of course, there's, you know, general trucking and freight cost. Um, so this might go to people like our beet harvest folks who do a lot of, you know, the trucks are about to start rolling up and down the road here very soon. Uh, anybody who's who's shipping uh, whatever grain commodity that they're harvesting this fall, freight cost is going to be considerably higher. A lot of that is already baked in via the diesel price of diesel. But the cost to hire truck drivers is going up as well. Labor costs across the country have increased. Uh, quite dramatically, double digit percentages. Um, and if you look, you know, if we go back to 2021, uh, this increase has been uh, considerable. So that's one thing that we have to watch out for this year is that there might be some sticker shock as far as what it's going to cost to get grain hauled in and out of the field into uh, its final destination or its uh, storage, storage space. Now, here's another one, and I've fielded several calls on this, and that's uh, decisions to trade off machinery this fall. Um, and there's more to it than just the cost factor. So just going nationally, farm machinery and equipment costs are up about 18 uh, percent over where they were a year ago. So that's a calculation from this index. And some of the challenges are. Uh, not just in the increase in costs, so some sticker shock of being up 15 to 20 percent in some cases, anywhere and anywhere in between. But the fact that with some new equipment, you pay for it up front and you're not going to be able to take delivery on it until, you know, next summer. That and that's and that's had a profound impact on used equipment as well, because if you're in a situation or if one of the producers is in a situation where they need harvest equipment this fall, uh, your only option may be to actually buy used equipment, which then, you know, a lot of other folks wind up in the same situation. And so then you drive up used prices as demand for used equipment increases because, you know, if it's used, it's probably sitting on the lot and available for you to take possession of right away. So not only is used, uh, new farm equipment costs up considerably, but uh, you may not be able to, you may be on a wait list or waiting to take delivery for several months up to maybe perhaps even a year uh, before you can get it. So anybody who is thinking about, for instance, um, some new equipment for, and, and I hate to say it, but are you thinking about spring planning? If you're think if uh, some producers are thinking about, they need planning equipment, they need a new planner, they need a new disc, they need some of this other stuff. Uh, you may have to start, if you're looking at new, you may have, you should probably be searching already because uh, it could be several months uh, before anyone is it, anything's available for them to take and if they have to go used the price of used equipment relative to new is very high right now and uh, for all the reasons that i already mentioned so that's something to that you're going to want to remind producers and talk them through that hey this is the situation and here's the thing um with with equipment it's been my experience and i haven't been at this as long as some for instance frame who's been at this a long time but typically if there is a price correction on equipment, there isn't typically much of a correction on new equipment. So what will happen a lot with new equipment is the prices will stop increasing or, or stop increasing at such a uh, high rate, but they don't really decrease. Okay, they, they kind of level off. Used equipment, on the other hand, has the potential to significantly decrease 
in 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 value. That that ha that ha that's happened before as recently as you know 2014 or so. The price of used equipment came down considerably uh, once a lot of the new equipment becomes available and everybody's trading stuff off. Dealers are having a hard time getting used equipment sold off the lot. As a result, the price of used equipment comes down. That's probably going to happen in the future, although I, I really hate to speculate to when. I doubt it's next year, considering that there's still these long wait lists for, for new equipment. So I think that used equipment will probably hold its value for a while, a good while. But again, impossible right now for me to really say when that's when the when the pressure is going to be off. And I suppose that's going to happen when eventually uh, it, more of the uh, machinery lots and equipment lots are have new equipment sitting there for folks to uh, take possession of right away. So natural gas, I just wanted to comment on this um, before I go into the next portion, and that's the, the potential for pre-pricing fertilizer. Big spike in natural gas uh, in, in, in 2021 and natural gas prices this year in 2022 have, have continued to move uh, upwards as well. Um, I know we don't do a, a lot of natural gas drying in North Dakota. Um, other states, they do, they do more of it. You have to pipe it in, uh, unlike propane, which you transport typically and store on, on farm. But this also ties directly into fertilizer prices. Um, a lot, in, 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 historically, natural gas prices and fertilizer prices were tied very closely together, highly correlated. Over time, that correlation has kind of fallen off um, to a degree where the price of natural gas is not a big a factor in what the overall price of anhydrous and then your, your N type fertilizers are down the road. But right now, um, it's definitely a factor because of the, you know, you've got countries like Europe, for instance, who had got a lot of their gas from, from uh, uh, you know, Ukraine and, and, and Russia and these other countries. And that's potentially not going to be there this year, driving up the uh, global price of natural gas. And if the price of natural gas definitely gets high enough, um, it's going to have a, an impact on the cost of nitrogen fertilizers because that's the main ingredient in, in producing them. So kind of leading me into the fertilizer uh, discussion, it's usually around this time of year, uh, October, September, November, when I start talking about potentially pre-pricing fertilizer for spring because usually fertilizer has a cyclical price nature where it's higher in the during spring planting so march april may than it is in safe during harvest season as co-ops and and then natural gas manufacturer or natural gas uh, fertilizer manufacturers in general um, start trying to get rid of some inventory this year is different though uh i i think to uh, to a degree and that's because of the high price of uh, nitrogen fertilizers that we saw last spring uh, reaching records. You can see from this chart from DTN around March and April of last year, urea, for instance, topped $1,000 a ton nationally. It's since come down, uh, which is good, down about 20% since April where, where, where it peaked. And so I'm not as uh, adamant that folks pre-price or potentially start pricing fertilizer heading into spring of uh, 2023 simply because I don't know that it's going to, that, that I think there's an outside chance that it continues to come down a little bit further. So if, if you are going to pre-price, maybe waiting several months from now to be, to do it, but I'm not sure that we're going to be, get back up to a thousand dollars a ton. A lot of that was uncertainty baked in to these prices that folks just didn't know what was going to happen. Now that a considerable amount of time has passed, some of that uncertainty on how what the supply is going to look like of natural gas and then eventually fertilizer is going to be, some of that risk premium has been taken out of it. So it's more fundamentals driven and less based on some speculation of, of, of supply availability. I don't think that that, that that risk is going to be built back in. So it may pay this year to actually wait and, and be able to save 50 or hundred dollars a ton, uh, over, over, uh, over pre-pricing this year with some of the, some of these fertilizers. Phosphorus, same story. It's down about 10%. So, uh, not the big reduction that, that, that nitrogen has seen. So about half that, so 10%. So down below a thousand dollars a ton on map, 
and, and DAP as well. So again, I don't, I don't think that this is going to be another product that is probably the, the top's going to come off of it again, heading into spring. So it may pay definitely to wait a few months before thinking about um, going ahead and pricing some of these inputs. Potash, on the other hand, is the one fertilizer that really hasn't moved. It's really not coming off of the high that, uh, that, that it saw in early April. A uh, big reason for that is <clears throat> the fundamentals on it are still the same. A lot of potash comes from Belarus and, and Russia. We get most of ours from Canada, but Belarus and Russia are big world suppliers. Okay. And so, you know, that takes that world price up. And right now the expectation is that, you know, things may not be resolved in the next six months or so. So that potash price remains elevated uh, until perhaps some of the sanctions come off uh, um, Russia and Belarus and, and the conflict and in going into Ukraine. So there's probably not going to be a lot of relief for potash prices anytime soon. Uh, the good news on it, though, supply wise, we're OK. We get most of our we import most of the potash we use, but we get most of it from Canada, almost all of it. So. Now I'm going to shift gears on this product, uh, this cost uh, uh, topic, and that is interest rates. OK, so this is a. Uh, 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 where interest rates were as of the 30th of August, so about a week ago or so. Prime rate was five and a half percent. And then in 2021, that prime rate was three and a quarter. So up about two and a quarter percent uh, uh, compared to last year. The 30 day LIBOR average is up, up over you know 2.4 percent. The one year up considerably. And the 10-year treasury is effectively doubled. And then we see that CCC loan rate uh, has went from 1.1 1. 1 and basically an eighth percent up to 4%. So a big increase there uh, in, in the CCC loan rate. So anybody looking to utilize that uh, tool that, that's available to them, uh, the, per, the interest rate that they're going to pay on that is, is dramatically higher than it was. I will still say it's, it's pretty low. By historical standards, four percent is still pretty low, but compared to one and one point one two five percent, four is is quite a bit higher, uh, several magnitudes. And then we, I use mortgage rates a lot of times as just a proxy for like what folks might wind up paying for like a loan on to purchase new farmland or something like that. And as of uh, eight eighteen, so these are a little bit dated behind a few weeks um, to get the average and the data from it. But the 30 year about 5.1% and a 15 year 4.55. If you go back to last year, these rates were dramatically lower. I mean, below 3% in most cases for the 30 year. So up a couple of percentage points uh, over last year. So uh, definitely a noticeable increase as the Fed has increased uh, the federal funds rate over the last uh, couple of quarters. And then here's a uh, weekly mortgage rates looking at a uh, uh, this one going back is a primary market survey U.S. weekly average. And this is as of 818 as well. And all I did here was this is on a long run. So this this chart here is a shorter time horizon. This one's looking from about 2013 to now. So you see how that increase there uh, looks pretty dramatic. But I like to put it into historical perspective. These are some of the highest rates we've seen since about 2009 or 10. OK, so. But even those weren't ter terribly high. You have to go back to 2009 or 10 to be as high as they were now. But prior to that, they'd remained above five, six, seven percent for a considerably long time. So historically, interest rates still aren't very, are not very high uh, uh, compared to the historical average, but much higher than they've been over the last couple of years for sure. So I show this to say um, some folks have talked about uh, in the news have said, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? The technical definition of a recession is two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth, which we had, albeit somewhat small. Quarter two, I believe, was about 1.6% and or 0.6%. Quarter one was about a 1.6% decline, both of those negative. So by that definition, um, a slight recession, but with a twist on this one. Typically during recessions, unemployment rate goes up or gets gets worse. Uh, this time that hasn't really happened very much. It stayed low. The labor market, uh, labor labor supply is or labor demand is greatly outpacing labor supply. So we don't see the unemployment occurring with it. 
And I say all that to say, so what is the Federal Reserve going to wind up doing um, with these interest rates? So this, there's a meeting coming up in September and I watch these, I check them every few days. And what this is, is essentially, you could think of it like this. What is the market guessing or thinking that the Federal Reserve is going to do? And this number has changed quite a bit. Uh, before, so a few, three weeks ago, uh, the thought was that the Federal Reserve was maybe going to raise rates half a half a point, so 50 basis points. That's dramatically shifted, and the market's thinking there's going to be another three quarters of a point or 75 or percentage point, 75 basis point increase uh, at the September meeting here in a couple of weeks, which would push that number up to three to three and a quarter percent. And then I put the bottom chart in there to show uh, by March of 2023, where does the market think the federal funds rate is going to be? Uh, I would say um, almost a majority thinks it's going to be four to four and a quarter percent or more. And then you got a, a, a good chunk of folks who think it's going to be around 375 to three point, uh, 375 to 400 basis points or three and three quarters to 4%. But pretty much the market all the way across is baking in more rate or, or expecting more rate hikes. Uh, and a lot of that's going to come down to the inflation reports that come out for August, which should be out in a few days and then September and what that unemployment number no looks like. The Federal Reserve has said they're going to be aggressive at trying to prevent or slow the rate of inflation and get it down to the 2%, which is, which is where they like it to be. Uh, if they stick to their word and and it, all signs right now point to the fact that they will uh, if these inflation numbers come out high again for august and then even on to september i would expect this this may even shift even further this has been moving to the right implicate uh implying that the market is expecting higher and higher rates as the year has gone on as these inflation numbers keep coming in eight nine percent so that's something to watch uh, and so the expect expectation is the Fed is going to keep doing these these big rate hikes at least for the next uh, few months. So we can if going back to these uh, interest rate numbers, I fully anticipate that as the Fed keeps raising rates, some of this is going to go up. Now, one last thing to keep in mind on that is that the federal funds rate and the rate that consumers or farmers or whoever is going to pay. It's not a one for one. If the Federal Reserve increases the federal funds rate 150 basis points, let's say in the next couple of months or one and a half percent, that doesn't necessarily mean there's gonna be a one and a half percent increase in interest rates. It's not a one for one. And the higher this federal funds rate gets, the less impact it tends to have in, in a lot of cases on the actual consumer lending rate. And in fact, there's been times historically where the federal funds rate was actually higher than the, than the rate you could get at the bank. So it starts to lose its effect as it gets uh, higher and higher and higher. So last thing I just want to touch on is uh, uh, cash rents and land values. Um, <clears throat> rents, first of all, in from 2021 to 2022, both nationally and in North Dakota, this one's North Dakota's, this chart is for North Dakota, did not wind up going up a lot. Um, even though land values did go up considerably and my, my next slide kind of shows that but there was a there was some caution when it came to cash rents uh, especially considering where production costs were um heading into 2022. Uh, if we recall you know when are most rental contracts negotiated well they're negotiated in the winter time before spring planning um typically and at that time we already had sky high fertilizer prices we had fuel costs going up. We had uh, people worried about being able to acquire chemical herbicides, pesticides, whatever their chemistry was for the crop that they were growing. And so there probably there wasn't a big appetite to pay a higher cash rent for for the same land you've been farming or potentially renting new new land. So that wasn't there. So as a result, yes, there was a slight increase in cash rents in North Dakota, three percent. Nationally, it wasn't much. I, I don't have the slide in there, but I think it was around four and a half percent. So North Dakota was kind of on par with with uh, the, the nation, but not a big appetite for paying higher rents. On the other hand, there was a big appetite for buying land. And you might say, well, what's the justification for that? Why would 
somebody be willing to go out and buy new land with high production costs, but they won't be willing to increase their rent. And, and I, a big part of that was one, low interest rates. Two, perhaps even the biggest part was the, the last few years of uh, federal ad hoc programs, MFP one, two, and then CFAP, were all paid out to farmers in the form of cash. Well, what do you do with cash? You don't, you don't go pay higher rent, you go buy perhaps equipment or you go buy land with it if you have it laying around, that's typically the case. And so uh, a lot of that, and then we had a strong year in 2021, right? Because we had strong commodity prices at the end of the year, but production costs in 2021 were more in line with average than they, than they were in 2022. And so you got these, you had a big infusion of cash from CFAP, you had some, residual cash coming in from MFP2, and then you had a strong growing year. So essentially a lot of cash floating around. That cash was then turned into a new land purchase. And unlike with a cash rental agreement where you got one or two years to cash flow it and all that's all the money you're going to make, with a land purchase, you can hope that maybe there's going to be some capital gain down the road, that land prices are going to continue to increase, and you can you can make some of that equity up that way. Uh, if you wind up paying a lot right now so but back to but just kind of my two cents and outlook real quick on land values i do think that now that the that it's unlikely that there's highly unlikely and probably not going to happen that there's going to be any kind of big government program ad hoc program coming down the coming down at us in the form of a cash payment and while i think that 2022 is going to in the end prove to be a profitable year because of strong prices and uh, a decent growing season, I don't think that the, the margin is going to be the same as it was in 21. And as a result, we're not going to, farmers aren't going to be as flush with cash 2022 into 2023. Again, there won't be that high, that the, the ad hoc program payments coming in and interest rates are essentially doubled uh, where they were before. That's going to mute some of this land price growth. I, I would be sh absolutely shocked if land prices were I, I don't they're not going to go down but if they increase at the same rate that they did from 2021 to 2022 there'll probably be an increase but i don't think as high as the jump that that occurred uh th this this last year so with that i will go ahead and turn it over to frayne who will be talking about marketing strategies i believe uh yep. for this fall Thank you, Brian. And, and again, we'll have some time at the end uh, for, for Q&A. Um, so if there are some questions or things that you come up with, uh, again, please use the, preferably the Q&A function. But if you want to put it in the chat box, we will try and get to them when we get a chance. Uh, so here's my contact information. Um, I'm going to be going through kind of an outlook and update of what's currently going on. Talk a little bit about some marketing strategies, uh, in particular, as we get into the, the harvest season now. Um, so if there are th some things that you think about later on or want to reach out and visit about, um, I have my email here as well as my office number and cell phone number. So um, please, again, if there is something that comes up later on, uh, don't hesitate to, to visit. So with that, I will jump into corn. So I'm going to go through the, the kind of the big three corn, soybeans and wheat in that order. Um, this is some information. I usually start with the USDA information because that's what the market starts with. Um, a lot of the private forecasters do, even though they're doing their own forecasting, they do kind of cross check and validate with what USDA is saying just to make sure they're not too far out of the realm of possibilities here. So um, this is the information from USDA on both the production and the usage for corn. Uh, the column on the far right hand side in blue is for the current marketing year. So the marketing year for corn and soybeans starts on September 1. So we've now officially will be closing out uh, last marketing year and we'll be getting the new marketing year. Um, so we've been focusing on these, these blue numbers for a while because this is the crop that's been growing all summer. Um, this is the crop that will be harvested now sh shortly. So the green column is last year's information. And then on the far left-hand side in black would be from two years ago. So we're going to use that as kind of a reference point uh, to, to what, what we're looking at and what we're expecting to see uh, coming up for this marketing year. Um, before I dive into this in too, too much detail, and again, I'm not going to get too uh, 
um, detailed about the exact numbers because on Monday, just as a footnote, on Monday, uh, September 12th at about 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time, uh, USDA will come out with updated forecasts for the column in the blue. And we're not expecting major changes or major shifts. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what we might be able to see in, in those numbers coming out on Monday. But just recognize the information I have in the blue is from August 12th, so about a month ago. So again, every year, every month, USDA updates this information. It's called the WASDE report or the World Agricultural Supply Demand Estimates. They focus primarily on U.S. production and usage, but they look at also at the global um, um, conditions as well and try and do some forecasting on global supply and demand as well as what's happening here in the U.S. So I'll focus on kind of some U.S. numbers. I am going to talk a little bit about some changes in the global um, environment that we need to be continuing to watch. So right now, kind of the focus is really on what is our yield and yield potential, especially for corn and soybeans. Um, now, August is the first month that USDA updates uh, their yield forecast based off of primarily survey information. So up until August, USDA is using essentially a trend line yield. So they're using average yields based on history, adjusted for technology, uh, better farming practices. Oops. It's jumping on me automatically, or I'm not sure why, um, as well as um, uh, adjustment for a kind of up or down based on planting progress. So if the crop is planted earlier, planting progress is really fast. The yield obviously has gr greater potential. The crop has greater potential. Now, in August, USDA turns to a different methodology to come up with their yield and yield forecasts. So in August, they send out a survey of to farmers and say, what do you expect your yield to be? They also use some satellite imagery, which I'll show you some, some in a moment. Basically, it's, it's uh, uh, using the NDVI, that vegetative index, as a proxy for how healthy is the crop. And they're using that to kind of cross-validate what some of the farmer surveys are telling them. Now in September, so we're coming up into the September report on Monday, they're going to resurvey farmers and say, you know, now given another month worth of crop development, what do you expect your average to be on your farm? They're going to also use, again, some satellite imagery to try and cross validate, but they're also going to send out enumerators. They're going to, they hire people, the scouts, to go out into selected fields across the United States and actually do yield estimates very similar to what a crop insurance agent would do. So now in September, we're going to have three pieces of information to try and uh, get a more accurate read on what, what is the average yield for a state, but then also what's happening at the national level. So the information we got last month in August, national average yield was about 175.4. That was kind of an updated number. It was down slightly from the 177 number, which was the trend line. So we're looking at slightly below average yields based on history. Um, recently, Pro Farmer did their crop tour uh, they came up with an estimate, their estimate for national average at about 168.1. Again, quite a bit lower than what USDA is forecasting currently. Uh, but I want to caution everybody, USDA looks at 31 states uh, for corn and soybeans. They do farmer surveys across 31 state area. The Pro Farmer Series only does nine states. So they do a a, a kind of a more concentrated look at what's going on within the Corn Belt and kind of extrapolate or, or take those numbers and say, what does that mean for national numbers? Now, more recently, in the last couple of days, a, a few private forecasters now are starting to come out with their individual estimates. I picked a few of them just to give you an idea of what uh, kind of the private forecasters are looking at. So StoneX, which is formerly FC Stone, uh, came out with a number of about 173.2. Um, IHS Market, which used to be um, 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 Informa Economics, came out with a 171.6 number. So I think that the, 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 the viewpoint right now is that because of some, some drier conditions, especially in the Western Corn Belt, which I'll show you in a moment, the yield estimates, the yield expectations for corn nationally is starting to drop a little bit. And again, a lot of this information is already already baked into or already being been evaluated and, and 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 incorporated into the futures market. And again, the cash market uses the futures market as that starting point for determining local cash prices. So I'll, I'll get into that in 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 just a moment and try and clarify some of the details. 
So the moral of the story is the trade, most trade estimates right now are expecting the national average corn yield that's reported by USDA on Monday to be down slightly from the number that we saw in August. So we'll have to see what USDA's number is relative to what some of these private forecasters are. So again, just visually showing you the blue line is the trend line. So that would be, think about that as the average yield that's been adjusted for better farming practices for the technology we're currently using in agriculture. Uh, the red line is the national average yield um, uh, for each of the years. The little dot on the far right-hand side is the current USDA forecast for, for national average yields for the August report. So what are some of the things? We're focusing a lot on weather, weather conditions. We're in some really key uh, crop development stages now, especially in the corn belt for corn and soybeans. Uh, the, the, the cob fill um, as well as pod set and, and pod filling is going on in a lot of the corn belt. Uh, a lot of people use the drought monitor index as kind of a proxy for, you know, what are the areas of, this, of the nation that we need to be concerned about from a production standpoint. Um, it is something that I talk about, even though personally I don't put a lot of weight on, because uh, as most farmers and in, in, in folks in, in this part of the world realize is that even though you might have some very dry soil conditions, if you get shots of rain at the right time, uh, at some key development stages, you can still have a very good crop. And so there isn't as probably as much correlation between final yield estimates and these drought monitor maps as, as people had expected, but it is one of, one of those proxies. It's one of those things that we're looking at. So what are the areas that the market is currently focused on from a weather standpoint? And hopefully you can see my cursor here. The big area we're focused on is in not only in South Dakota, Nebraska, but also Western and kind of South, Southeastern uh, Iowa. So there's some pockets in Iowa. There's a little strip here in Minnesota that we've got some concerns about, but really it's this it's South Dakota and Nebraska area that we're really concerned about. When we get into Kansas, Eastern Kansas is in a little bit shape, better shape. Western Kansas, where they have more of the wheat, is in, in a bit rougher shape. There are some areas now in Indiana that are starting to show up and show some stress as well. And I do think some of the information that came out of the pro farmer crop tour recognize some of that, that Indiana was starting to have some, some areas that were starting to suffer that may take the top end off the yield potential. Illinois in general is, is in pretty good shape. When you get into Southern Missouri, a lot of this region in Southern Missouri doesn't have a lot of cropland area to it. It's kind of the what they call the Lake of the Ozarks region. So most of the core corn and soybean producing regions in, in Missouri is kind of the northern half of the state. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, and this is, again, an example of some of the satellite imagery that USDA is using to try and help get a better feel for, you know, what areas, uh, how large an area and what areas of the country might have some yield potential problems or yield, yield issues. So... I, I chose this map because of the contrast. It's, it, there's other uh, NDVI maps that you can use as, as proxies. I use this one because of the, of the contrast. It's a little easier to start to see where are the areas of, of crop development that we are concerned about. So in this particular version, this is a, think of this as a, 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 an index, an index that runs from zero to one. So what we're looking at, what US, what the, the satellite imagery has done is saying, well, what is the NDVI? What is the vegetative health? How green is the crop right now relative to the time period from 2000 through 2021? So we're looking at for this week, how does the greenness of the crop this week compare to that 20 through 2021 timeframe, about, 20, 20, about 21 years worth of data? And they do this on a weekly basis. So the, what they're saying is that a ratio or an index of one, 1 1.0 is, that is the highest uh, vegetative health that we've seen in that 21 period, 21 day, uh, year period. If you get down to zero, it means that's the worst or lowest score, lowest rating that we have seen during that time period. So if you notice on the scaling on the right-hand side, these really dark blue, it's from about 80% 80, 80 to 100% of the best that we've ever seen. So you look at areas like Illinois, uh, northern parts of Iowa, parts of southern Minnesota. When we look at the vegetative health this week or this last week, relative to what we normally see this time of year, 
we're definitely on that high end of the range. Relative to Nebraska, especially you get into the south eastern Nebraska here, uh, and, and even into parts of central Nebraska, parts of South Dakota, we're starting to see these reds and pinks, which means that this is some of the worst uh, vegetative health we've seen at this time of year in that 21 uh, year time period. So the areas that we're watching, again, we're starting to see some of the deterioration of, of yield potential and the greenness of the crop in Indiana. We're starting to see those blues turn more into the greens, which would be more of an average or typical. When we get into Iowa, we're seeing these regions on the drought monitor map where there's, the crop seems to be under some stress relative to what we would see this time of year. And in particular, then, as you get into the Western Corn Belt, Nebraska, South Dakota, and even parts of North Dakota. Now, the one caution I will say about the North Dakota NDVI uh, uh, numbers right now is that because our crop was planted so late, our crop development, we, we were planting late. We've had some really good uh, growing degree days. So the, the crop, the corn crop in particular, has been catching up a little bit. But because the crop was planted so late, when you look at the greenness of the crop right now relative to what we would normally see, we're going to get a little bit higher scores simply because the crop development isn't quite as progressed as much as we would normally see. So my point in bringing all of this up is if, if the, the yield and yield potential that some of the private forecasters as well as USDA is suggesting, we will likely have some pretty good corn and soybean yields here in the eastern Corn Belt and along the Mississippi River Valley. But when we get into the Western Corn Belt, the Western growing regions, parts of Missouri, Iowa, and in particular into Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and even potentially into North Dakota, that's the areas where we might not have as great a yield. And I, I know that one of the things in talking to some of the, um, some of the merchandisers, they're a little bit concerned about test weights. And again, is if, we, if the crop starts running out of moisture later in the season, even though the cob may have filled and we may have a lot of, of, of seed count on the cob, or in the case of soybeans, a lot of potential seeds in each pod, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to get the test weights coming out of those. That as the crop starts to shut down because of drier conditions, it may not put on in the corn case of corn as much carbohydrates. We also may have some of those smaller BB sized soybeans. So potentially what that means is we may start to see basis levels, local cash prices in the Western Corn Belt hold up relatively well compared to the Eastern Corn Belt, which means that the market is going to try and have to pull some of the grain that we're producing in the Eastern Corn Belt into the Western Corn Belt to service some of the, the processing needs, in particular the ethanol plants and the soybean crushing facilities. So just some things to be thinking about and looking at as we move forward. So coming back to kind of the bigger picture issues, um, how does this year compare to other years? This is on the usage side. I've talked a lot about the production side, but what about the demand or usage portion of it? Now, again, we're going to get more updates throughout the growing season and throughout the rest of the winter on what our outlook for feed utilization, which is the, the blue line on top for corn. Um, the red line is ethanol consumption. Uh, the black line is exports. And then the green line is kind of everything else. So once again, those little dots on the far right-hand side are the current USDA forecast. All of the other numbers that are solid would represent actual numbers that have been reported. So these forecasted numbers can change a little bit over time. So I want to focus on a couple key numbers that the market is going to be watching and, and can watch on a regular basis. One of them is the ethanol number. Um, so again, every week, the Department of Energy provides information on, on a weekly basis how much ethanol has been manufactured the, the previous week. Um, and this is a chart showing the weekly ethanol production going back to, to, to about 2015. Um, you can see, obviously, we had some major issues during COVID. Uh, when, when we shut down our economy, people weren't driving very much. We didn't have the demand base for ethanol. But now that we're starting to open up our economy again, COVID is, is not necessarily under control, but at least we're, we're doing a better job of managing it. Um, we're starting to drive some more miles. Now, the higher gasoline prices are also starting to curb some of that demand base a little bit. So if we look on the far right-hand side here, we're starting to see this kind of the seasonal cycle for ethanol production 
kind of come back into that normal operating range. We have seen a drop off here now more recently in the last couple of weeks. But uh, again, I do think that we'll start to follow the seasonal cycle. So when we think about ethanol production, the profitability of making ethanol, yes, gasoline prices are important, but actually the bigger driver to that, the more important driver for the demand base is how many miles are we driving? So as long as gasoline prices don't curb uh, consumption too much, where we start to get into this kind of regular driving cycle, I do think that the ethanol production, the ethanol demand will be there. Um, so there's some pricing things going on with ethanol relative to uh, gasoline that might cause some temporary di um, disruptions. Uh, but I really don't see that over a longer time period as being a major concern. So coming back to the USDA's forecast for ethanol consumption um, this year versus last year, I think it's going to be relatively stable. Um, I guess I would tend to personally agree with some of the USDA forecasts. When we get into the exports, this is a lot harder to predict. And this is obviously where some of the political disruptions because of the caused by the war between Russia and Ukraine are starting to cause some more concerns. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those when we when we visit about wheat. So what I've tried to do here is show who are the major corn exporters in the world. So there's really four large exporters of corn. The United States, which is green, is the top one. The blue is Brazil. The black is Argentina. And then the gold is Ukraine. Now, Brazil had a much better corn year this year than they did last year. Um, they, the second crop corn, or what's called their safrina crop, was, was okay. It, it wasn't as large as what, what the trade was at first expecting, but it turned out to be still a pretty good crop. And so the expectation now is that Brazil will be one of our major competitors in the global market for corn and corn exports. Argentina, um, again, they've had some drier conditions. They've had some, some yield cuts. The, what's, there are some political issues going on now with their currency. They're trying to make the Argentine corn and soybean exports a little bit more favorable in the global market uh, because it, Argentina has had some very rapid inflation, which has caused some real concerns with exchange rates. Um, so there, the Argentine government is stepping in and trying to have basically a, a different exchange rate for uh, corn and soybeans relative to all of the other products they're dealing with. The one question I commonly get is, well, what about Ukraine? Uh, Ukraine historically has been a pretty significant um, ex corn exporter, but obviously because of the war and shipping problems, those the the forecast, the expectation is they will be able to ship some corn but not nearly at the volumes that they were originally. And so this is, again, one of the things uh, that's impacting the corn market and the potential for the U.S. to be able to export our corn globally. So if we kind of try and synthesize all this, what does this mean for, for pricing and price potential? Um, I want you to focus on the blue bars on the bottom. That's the stocks to use ratio. So it's scaled on the far right-hand side. The far left-hand side is scaled in billions of bushels, which represents the green line, which is total U.S. production, the red line, which is total U.S. consumption, including exports. So you can look at kind of that relationship between production and consumption. What I really want you to focus, though, is on the blue bars in the bottom. So if we take our ending stocks, how much grain do we think we're going to have in the bin just before harvest, and we divide that by total use, we get an estimate of what percentage of our total needs do we have in reserve in case there's a problem. Now, notice the far right-hand side, which is in, in red, is the current USDA forecast. It looks like we have, they're forecasting just under 10% carryover stocks. And 10% is kind of an important number for corn because if it gets over 10% carryover stocks, the market feels pretty comfortable. They've, we've got a margin for error. You know, If there are some problems that, or disruptions that occur, we have... The extra reserves to be able to, to use that as a buffer or shock absorber. But if we get below 10%, then market gets kind of nervous. And, and we tend to see more, in general, higher prices, but a lot more price volatility. So for those years, we have a, the blue line is relatively small. We tend to have higher average prices, but again, a lot more volatility. Any p new piece of news tends to put more of a shock value into the marketplace, both upwards if it's if it's positive prices, but also downwards if it's something that is negative for pricing. So a couple time periods I want you to look at is, of course, what we're going through right now. 
And what what that how that compares to what happened in 2011, 2012, and 13, the last time we had these lower carryover stocks. So this is a chart of the futures market prices for corn going back many, many years. And I pulled this chart this morning at about eight o'clock because uh, the futures market takes a short break between eight and about 8.30. So I pulled these charts at that point. So this, this should be as of this morning. Um, the blue the blue over here is the current price. So that was as of about, again, eight o'clock. 6.82 would be the December futures. We can look at that price relative to what we've seen historically. So notice the volatility, the price bouncing that we got here in the last several years versus what we saw back here in this 2011, 2012, and 2013 timeframe. So when we are carryover stocks down here, for example, in 2015 through about 2020, when we had relatively strong carryover stocks, we had that buffer. We saw lower average prices in the futures market as well as in the cash and a lot more stability in the market price. It was a lot harder for a farmer to say, boy, there's a big shock in the market. I'm going to try and price something at that point. We're in this range right now where because of those ending stocks are getting tighter, we can see this big price swings. And that's going to be a bit difficult. It's going to cause some frustration for farmers as they try and decide what to do. So let's zoom in a little bit. This is, again, what's taken a chart about 8 o'clock this morning for December futures. Now, every one of these bars represents one day. So we're looking at, um, at what happened this morning relative, which is black. The blue lines I put in, and those are kind of psychological barriers, support and resistance levels. Um, what I want to point out, though, is that look at the, the general upward price movement we've had since earlier this sum, summer. So as, as the crop has developed, we're starting to see some of these big areas of the, the major corn belt start to have some production issues. As our, as our stocks, the supply seems to be a little bit smaller. We still have a relatively strong demand base. Our reserves or carryover stocks are starting to shrink. We tend to see this upward movement in prices. So again, the information we get on Monday, the big question I have in my mind is this about 680 seems to be a psychological barrier. That seems to be kind of a, a, a limit as we look at prices here but it was also a, a, a kind of a resistance level or support level, excuse me, that we saw here uh, this last spring. So in my opinion, 6 to 80 is going to be on the futures is going to be kind of a critical point. If we can have enough price momentum, if the, if the information in the market is strong enough to be able to push us through that psychological barrier of 680, the next will be just a little bit over $7. So we will probably have another 20 cent range um, if if the crop continues to have problems or it looks like it's going to be smaller than normal or our exports or domestic demand base is going to be stronger than we expect, if we can break through the $7 uh, mark, then there's about a 50 cent range that we can get to up in these higher levels. But it's going to take, in my opinion, some pretty um, large information. There's going to be have to be some pretty big shocks to the system to be able to get us above that $7 futures market price. So again, I from a pricing standpoint, I would look at that as, as some key pricing points. Shifting to soybeans, a uh, very similar story right now. The focus is really on yield and yield potential. Um, the August report from USDA was about 51, almost 52 bushels per acre national average yield. Pro Farmer Tour, as well as Stonex and Mar uh, IHS Market are looking at some very similar numbers. So it would the surprise to the market on, on next Monday would be if USDA took that number down more than we had expected. I do think we'll see a little bit of slippage uh, just because some of those crop condition ratings in, in the Western Corn Belt are, are, are not as favorable as they were about a month ago. Uh, but I don't expect it to see a, a really big contraction because the soybean, you know, the soybean harvest is, it hasn't started yet. We still have some development time, especially as we get into the core Corn Belt states. When we look at the current forecast relative to kind of a, the long-term average, if we're looking at an average, we're, we still are looking at an average yield above the trend line. Um, so it, it right now, it's looking as though we'll probably have a better than average yield from a yield standpoint. Uh, but again, that can change quickly depending upon you know heat and temperature as we get into these key development stages for the soybean crop. When we look at usage, uh, when we look at consumption, the soybean story is a little simpler. We really have two big uses, the crushing industry, as well as exports. 
Um, notice that the crushing industry has been a very strong and stable growing area. I'm going to talk about that again in a little bit as we look at some new crushing plants coming online. Um, exports, short-term exports is really the area that we need to be watching, especially for the next couple of months. So let me talk just really quickly about crushing because I know that I'm getting a lot of questions in particular about uh, the ADM uh, marathon plant that's being constructed now at Spiritwood. Uh, there was groundbreaking for the ethanol plant for the North Dakota soybean, um, uh, um, uh, what is it, the North Dakota soybean growers, which is the uh, a, a, a joint venture between Minnesota soybean, as well as some private investors in Castleton. Um, there's also a plant that's being um, planned and constructed for, care, uh, excuse me, for um, um, in Minnesota at, um, um, I'm losing the name of the town right now, just across the river in Minnesota. Uh, now, those are local developments, so and, and obviously will have an impact on local demand base and basis levels. Uh, but we need to look at a lot of the pricing that I'm talking about today is really at the national level. So I just wanted to remind everybody that right now there's about 14 plants that are either under construction that our existing plants are going through with some kind of expansion or that are on, still on the drawing board under development. So my guess right now, my personal belief is I don't think all 14 of those plants will get built, but of the obviously some of them are currently under construction or under expansion. So we will see a growth in the demand, uh, the demand base, the ability of the U.S. to be able to receive and crush soybeans. Most of that has been driven by uh, move towards renewable diesel fuel, uh, stronger demand for the oilseed portion of it. Now, if all of those plants, at least conceptually, if all those plants were built, we'd see a growth of about 45 million bushels of ca additional capacity. So what we'd, we'd go from about 2.2 billion to about 2.7 billion. Now that would be a huge expansion. Now that will happen over the next several years. So it's not an immediate growth in demand base, but it is, these projects are coming online. I think we, by this time next year, we're going to see some of those expansions in particular in the Corn Belt start to kick in and that demand base for crushing will start to grow. So longer term, I do think this is going to be a major change because once the plants are in are constructed in operation, they tend to stay in operation just because of the large overhead costs. So something in the, a little bit more distant future to be looking at. Short term, um, soybean again, it's it, we, it's the global soybean trade is actually relatively simple to understand. You look at what's happening in the U.S., what's happening in Brazil, and what's happening in China. So when we look at soybean exports, this would be export for whole soybeans. The blue line is Brazil, the green line is the United States, the black line is Argentina. Now Argentina produces a lot of soybeans, but they don't export a lot of whole soybeans. They usually process it into oil and meal first and then export the oil and meal. Now, here's the real driver, of course, is the Chinese imports, which is the red line. Right now, there is some concern about whether USDA is, is overestimating the, 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 the rebound in demand for from China for global soybean production. Uh, because they've had some COVID shutdowns, their economy is not as strong as it normally is. The profit margins for producing hogs, in particular pork in, in China, has not been strong for, for quite some time. Um, so, you know, the, there are some industry analysts are saying, is, is USDA overestimating the ability of China to import uh, large amounts of soybeans off the global market? Now, they are going to import a lot of soybeans. There's no question. It's just how much are they going to import and they import and they're going to buy it from Brazil or are they going to buy it from the U.S.? So for soybeans, we have a relatively short window over the next about four to five months where really the soybean cr crop coming out of the U.S. will be the dominant source for Chinese buying. The expectation is that Brazil is going to have a very large production next year. Brazil is going to already planning to increase their acreage. If they get normal yields, they're going to have a real big monster crop and going to put a lot of pressure on U.S. soybean exports later on this winter. So again, just something to keep in mind. I do think there's an opportunity over the next several months, but we're gonna, it's a relatively tight window that we have to work with. 
When we look at the blue bars in the bottom, our soybean inventories are relatively tight. They're not at historically low levels, but they're definitely on the tighter side of, of the supply. Usually that 5%, 5 to 6% is kind of that tipping point that I talked about before, similar to corn. So when we look at price volatility, again, in this graphic, the blue is the price we saw this morning. I drew in the red lines and the black lines to kind of show historically long-term what have we seen and where do we compare today versus what we saw, for example, in this 2012, 11, 12, and 13 time period, kind of the last time we had really big high soybean prices. Obviously, we had this spike during the summer, but as we got the crop planted and it looked like we're going to get some production this year, prices have dropped. So let's look at what's going on, you know, kind of shorter term. This is again uh, daily prices. Uh, the blue, uh, the, excuse me, the black line is where we were this morning at about eight o'clock. The blue lines are those support and resistance levels. You know, we've we've had more of a choppier trade in the soybean market. And again, some of that is not only the size of the U.S. crop, but also then some of the things that are going on in Argentina and their ability to supply product into the global market as well. So there's, there's some conflicting news, if you will, in the global markets right now that's been impacting soybeans. We're going to get some more production information next Monday that will obviously have an impact on the soybean market. Whether it'll be a positive impact or a negative impact is yet to be seen. So shifting into, into wheat, and I know we're going to run out of time here, so I apologize. Hopefully there's some questions. Um, wheat is a little bit different story. Again, when we look at, excuse me, go back to production. Uh, we're going to have a reasonably good wheat year. I know that the winter wheat crop, especially in Kansas, was kind of a mixed bag. Uh, pr proteins tended to be a little bit higher than average. Uh, yields were very variable, but in general, it'll be an okay hard red winter wheat crop. The soft red winter wheat crop looks like it'll be a pretty good uh, production year. We're still in wait to hear kind of what the, the final yield numbers are from this the spring wheat growing region. Um, there is some uncertainty yet, but it looks as though the early reports that I have heard, and again, please uh, feel free to confirm or deny, is that you know the wheat crop is looking pretty good. Uh, protein levels are about normal. Uh, test weights are actually been pretty good. The large variability in yields, depending upon when it was seeded and what kind of, of land it was seeded on, but in general, a pretty good spring wheat crop as well. So let's look at the demand base. The blue line is, is what, they, what USDA calls food. It's basically domestic milling, um, relatively stable over many, many, many years. So we don't, we don't see, even though prices change, we don't see a lot of, uh, of shift in the amount of, of wheat we use domestically. Um, the red line is exports. That's obviously the area that we have kind of the most concern. So I want to focus in a little bit on exports. Um, I, I looked at historically, what are the, the major exporters of wheat? Um, I, I included kind of shadowed some of these other countries, but I wanted to highlight what's going on in Russia, which is the red line, the United States, which is the black line, and then Ukraine, which is the blue line. Um, so because of the war going on, Ukraine is having some problems. They are able to ship some of their product, but not at the volumes that they normally would. Russia had a is going to have and is having right now a very big production year. They've got a very big wheat crop coming. Um, the expectation is that Russia will start picking up some of the sales business that Ukraine cannot meet because their shipping has been a little bit more more fluid than than Ukrainians. Um, they have their supply chains haven't been disrupted as much as the Ukrainians have. Uh, so the idea is that some of those countries that may have been buying from Ukraine may shift to Russia. That's yet to be seen. Um, Russia is now starting to complain that they're not getting kind of the interest in the marketplace that they normally would at this time of year. So again, the USDA numbers that I'm showing on this graphic might be a little bit overestimated for the Russian um, Russian wheat exports. But again, they had a very good, big crop. They're going to be very price competitive. Just to show you what I'm talking about, these are uh, the value of wheat loaded onto an ocean vessel. These are daily prices. Um, the, the three uh, lines that I want you to look at is the, is the brown line, which is uh, Ukraine. That's a, this is all for winter wheat. Now it's not a spring wheat price. This is all winter wheat prices. So these are global prices. So the brown is Ukraine. The red is Russia. The green on the very top is a hard red winter wheat loaded at the Gulf of Mexico, basically at New Orleans. So you can start to see how the U.S. price compares to 
other comparable hard red winter wheats in the global market. Um, again, the because of the size of the Russian crop, uh, that's also starting to pull down some of the global prices. And the U.S. winter wheat crop has to be competitive with our global partners. Um, and, and so we're starting to see some softening of the hard winter, winter wheat price, which again is now putting some weight into the spring wheat prices. When we look at, let me just look at spring wheat specifically. When we look at carryover stocks for spring wheat, we are relatively tight right now based on recent history. We're seeing that in spring wheat prices. So again, as of this morning, the, the blue is what we saw at about 913. This is going back historically. We have seen obviously higher prices this last summer, but again, that was a lot. That was a combination of the, the war between Ukraine and Russia, but also very delayed planting we had here in the Northern Plains. So when we look at today's prices, my point, let me go back. My point is today's prices relative to history are still very strong. The problem is we've gotten, we've kind of got our, our, our thoughts and ideas distorted by what happened this last spring. So if you look at what's going on in the spring wheat market, we've got kind of a trading range going on right now. Um, there are some things that might break us out of that trading range, either up or down. And it really comes down, in my opinion, to the size of the Canadian crop. So this is uh, Canadian spring wheat production in gold versus U.S. spring wheat production in green. So you can see what's kind of the trends going on. So we had a recover in, in spring wheat production here in the U.S., but also in Canada. Now, here's where they produce spring wheat in Canada. Um, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and especially northern Saskatchewan is where most of the spring wheat is produced, and then into Alberta. These, these kind of beige areas are really hardcore Durham-producing regions. So there's a lot of wheat produced. It's just, is it spring wheat or is it Durham? So when we look at spring wheat, it tends to be a little bit in the, in the central and northern parts of Saskatchewan. The southern part right along the Montana-U.S. border tends to be more of the Durham growing region. The reason I'm bringing that up is if you look at drought conditions and soil moisture conditions in, in not only Manitoba, which have been relatively strong, but then you get into Saskatchewan and into Alberta, you know, this is the area that everybody's concerned about. So these drier areas in southern and central Saskatchewan, yes, it's impacting spring wheat, but it's probably having a larger impact, in my view, on the Durham prices and Durham outlook. Um, so with that, I will stop because I'm going to run out of time. I'm already one minute over. For me, that's actually not bad. So I'll stop sharing and we'll go to questions. I know that was a real quick blow through on, on topics. Um, I apologize for taking up so much time. Are there any questions for either Brian or myself? I know that's a lot to absorb. Okay, it looks like we have one question here. Um, who are the buyers of Russian wheat? Uh, actually, that's a very good question. Um, the big buyers of Russian wheat tend to be um, Egypt, um, North Africa, and parts of the Middle East. So Egypt is the largest single, largest single buyer of wheat globally as a single country. Uh, logistically, because of obviously Egypt is relatively close to the Black Sea, moving wheat from the, the Russian areas into th through the Black Sea, through the Strait of Istanbul into um, Egypt is relatively straightforward. Uh, Russia has both Russia and Ukraine have become major suppliers for for Egypt now because of some challenges again with the um, supply chains out of Ukraine. Russia has become the dominant buyer. But Russia also sells a lot of wheat into um, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, um, even into a little bit into India, Bangladesh, but also into North Africa. Um, so the countries, the point is the countries that Russia usually supplies or that Ukraine usually supplies are, are typically not big buyers of U.S. hard red winter wheat. Um, our prices tend to be a little bit higher. Most of our winter wheat buyers, hard red winter wheat, have uh, it's it's the Philippines, it's Mexico, um, it's Japan, it's those countries that have a little bit higher quality standards. Um, they want more consistency in their products. So even though we don't com usually compete head to head, uh, but it does impact obviously global supplies. So if if there's a country that typically buys from Russia or from Ukraine that can't get their wheat from those, those sources,
They will turn to the global market, possibly buy from Europe. They could possibly buy from Australia. They might come to the U.S., but again, it's relatively unlikely given the kinds of countries and some of the other trade restrictions that we have, in particular going into the Middle East countries. Very good question. One quick question, Freen. Certainly. With regards to stock to use, um, it seems like of the crops you mentioned, soybean, wheat, corn, the stock to use ratio for wheat is kind of lower than the rest. Um, this year versus last year, will that help the price? Um, it, it will to some degree. And what I showed, because of the sake of time, I showed you just spring wheat. If you look at the carryover stocks for all wheat, if you blend spring wheat, winter wheat, and, and durum and white wheat all together, in the U.S., we actually have what I would consider average carryover stocks for wheat. So what ends up happening then is we start seeing some price differentials between the different classes of wheat. So, so what typically you think about, well, what is the price in average for wheat? And we say, well, is spring wheat above or below some of the other classes? So of all the big three crops, corn, soybeans, and wheat, actually soybeans is the tightest supplies when we look at kind of the big picture issues. Um, then I would say probably corn. Uh, we're not really super tight on corn, but it's getting to a point where people are a little uncomfortable. We still have relatively comfortable stocks of wheat, but spring wheat we're a bit tight on. So it's a subclass. It's one of those uh, those areas where, yeah, I think spring wheat has probably some more price volatility than let's say a winter wheat would have. Uh, but I don't know that we're going to see great big rallies like we saw this last spring. So that would be more useful for our producers than because we produce a lot of the spring wheat versus Kansas. Correct. Correct. Yep. Yep. If no other well, questions, you can always send your questions or chat to um, Frain or Brian. Uh, thank you, Frain and Brian. Thank you all for participating this morning. Uh, this will be recorded so others who cannot make it or for those of us who are present and would like to kind of review certain parts, it will be available to you uh, in a short while, maybe a few days. Thank you all and have a good day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.